Major funding provided by the St. Johns River Water Management District with assistance from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Florida Department of Education, and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. This is a story of America's first river. Before English or Spanish was spoken here, people lived on its banks. Before man, huge prehistoric animals walked its shores. Before history was recorded, civilization flourished here. It was called the River of Lakes by the Seminole Indians, the River of Currents by the Spanish, the River of May by the French. Today, it is known as the St. John's River. Throughout time, the great rivers of the world have shaped the land and its people. Today, rivers are asked to serve society's needs, sometimes as a water supply, but more often as a means to transport commerce and waste. After centuries of exploring the St. John's, it was time to look at the river from some different angles. In the early part of this decade, Florida was experiencing some of the worst drought conditions ever recorded. Water levels dropped well below normal throughout the state. But all that changed in about one month in 2004. In that year, four named storms hit Florida three of them intersecting paths over the middle of the state. For people who lived in the way of Charlie, Francis, and Jean, the damage was tremendous. But the storms dumped millions of gallons of rainwater right where the state needed it the most, a silver lining if there ever was one. Water levels rose to an 80-year high, turning dry riverbeds into living laboratories. The research opportunity of a lifetime. It was an adventure just waiting for the right people. Explorer aquanauts Wes Skiles, Jill Heinerth, and Tom Morris have done this sort of thing before. They have taken up a quest to follow the journey of water all over our planet. They have traveled below the ground to trace the connective path of water through the landscape. They have chased the ocean's flow through melting icebergs. Now they're looking at a totally different challenge, trying to help people understand their connection to a modern river running right through the middle of urban America. Join a team of scientists and modern explorers on a journey of discovery as they travel to the source of the great St. John's River to see man's impacts and find out what is being done to protect this river for generations to come. Many great rivers start high in the mountains. The St. John's River is somewhat unique in that it gathers its waters from a wide expanse. The river is born from a vast marsh just north of the Everglades, and further downstream, large springs, lakes, and tributaries contribute to its flow. And like many rivers on our planet, it winds its way through great cities, backyards, and industries, finally joining the sea east of Jacksonville. It flows south to north at a very slow rate, so slow that many times it doesn't appear to flow at all. 
The first human residents of the river noticed that fact and named it Wallaka, River of Lakes. Its entire 310-mile length has been designated an American Heritage River. The first European settlers landed at the mouth of the St. John's and established Fort Caroline almost 60 years before the landing at Plymouth Rock. Naturalists William Bartram and John James Audubon carried out their most prominent work while exploring the St. John's River. Audubon and Bartram's artistic expressions excited people about an exotic new world awaiting discovery. Back when Orlando was little more than an army outpost, the railroad brought thousands of tourists to paddle boats traveling upstream to opulent resorts. Florida has been a tourist destination ever since. As the population grew, so did its effect on the river. Indians saw the river as sacred, while early settlers and developers saw it as a river of opportunity. The river was drained and fortunes were built. The diversion of billions of gallons of water daily greatly diminished supplies. The river was over-harvested. Almost every usable tree was cut down. Early engineering projects for the good of all mankind almost killed the river. But supplying clean water to a growing population is not a challenge unique to Florida. It is a global concern. Hard lessons learned on the St. John's may one day serve to help river and water systems around the world. This is a different expedition for Wes, Jill, and Tom. They are more likely to be found trudging through the jungle to find the source of the Nile. This time, they are on a quest to explore a river that passes through the heart of society to document the impacts that come with it. Our goal has to be to travel the entire length of the river and to do it in a manner through exploration and science that helps people make a connection. Here we are in our own backyard. Um, but you know, you look for close enough, you'll find wildernesses right here. There's spots that probably nobody's been into for 50 years. I think as we document this river, we're gonna take people on a really unique expedition. They're gonna see things that they've never imagined before by getting a view of the river from above and from underneath and seeing how the fingers of this river interweave into their lives. The journey begins at the mouth of the river on the Mayport Ferry. Mile marker one. We're beginning our journey on the St. John's with the smell of the ocean in the air. I'm really excited to be hooking up with the rest of the team and starting our journey upstream. The rest of the group is already getting set. More than 50 people will be helping the expedition leaders with everything from camera equipment to camping gear. The monitor should be going back into that. What about some of these chairs? Supplies are loaded for a journey that will take two weeks and requires tons of specialized equipment. Each team member brings different skills and perspectives to their journey. Their collective knowledge will provide a unique outlook on the inner workings of this great river system. We're a unique blend of filmmakers and scientists and explorers. And we're being given a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to explore one of the great rivers of the world. In total, the river flotilla will include two river boats, two skiffs, two canoes, five kayaks, three airboats. And to address the issue of seeing the river from a high vantage point, they come up with a unique solution. All right, Bob, you're on my wing. How's Pilots Ron Thorstad and Bob Tillman join the convoy with their peculiar flying inflatable boats. 
FIBS for short. It shouldn't be too far up ahead now. Part boat, part plane, these unusual hybrids will allow the team to take to the air at a moment's notice. Captain David Girardin is one of the most experienced scientists on the St. John's River. He is a seventh generation Floridian, and as guide, he is the only team member who has traveled the whole length of the river. I think this is a trip of a lifetime for all of us because I'm going kind of in time, I feel like. You know, I get farther and farther away from civilization and uh, get back to the root of the river. And I like that. They thread their way upstream, passing through Jacksonville. It is a city of more than a million people, and the river is why this city became a city. Jacksonville and its community have embraced the value of their river systems. They have conserved 80,000 acres for the largest urban park system in the United States giving residents an opportunity to connect with nature and appreciate their natural resources. Just upstream from Jacksonville, the FIBs make the graceful transition from airspace to waterway. But the team is still not sure if the FIBs are going to meet expectations. Nice landing, buddy. In order to be an important tool on this expedition, the tiny wing must carry the pilot and West, All right. plus the extra weight of his camera. And that is not a given. Oh, yeah. I'm full of confidence. Let's get this over while I'm uh, still willing. <laughs> okay. And me too. Clear drop. The fib usually takes off within seconds, but with all the extra weight, Getting airborne is looking questionable. Hey, Bob, look. Watch that cable back there, Wes. Don't, don't try to make this thing take off if that one to. We should be fine. Just south of Jacksonville, they enter a stretch of the river where scientists have been tracking high levels of pollution. River systems like the St. John's receive much of their waters from creeks and streams that run through every aspect of our lives. These tributaries carry with them runoff contaminants that wreak havoc on life within the river and create potentially serious health issues for the public. This is Tri-County Ag. 
Let's get the fence ready. Environmental scientist Pam Livingston Way joins biologist Tom Morris. They paddle upstream to the source of the pollution. So Deep Creek is one of the hot spots as far as um, tributaries that take a lot of nutrients to the St. Johns River. It's draining many, many acres of uh, potato fields and cabbage fields here in the Hastings area. One of the greatest boons to mankind was the introduction and widespread use of chemical fertilizers. With such fertilizers, farmers can grow more crops and feed millions of people. But for the river, there is a downside. Agriculture and urban runoff, leaky septic systems, and sewage discharges share something in common. They all deliver nutrients and organic substances which act as powerful fertilizers. Much of it ends up in the river, causing algae to grow very quickly. Scientists within state agencies are involved in an ambitious program to locate and manage high levels of contaminants entering the river. The program known as Total Maximum Daily Loads, or TMDLs, identifies those sources and creates strategies to reduce them. When runoff goes unmanaged, it can trigger algae blooms. Algae blooms block out the sun, causing underwater grasses to die. Without grasses, underwater creatures that use them for food, shelter, and spawning die. Birds and animals that rely on them for food have less to eat. Decomposing algae uses up oxygen in the water. Without enough oxygen in the water, more organisms die off. A growing population speeds up eutrophication by increasing the amount of harmful substances like fertilizers that soak into the ground and reach the river. And here we are. This is where it all starts. All the runoff. The fertilizers are applied. The fields are irrigated. And when the it rains too much, they drain that water, extra water right into canal Drains right out there. the furrow and into the canal one. To get a better view of Pam and Tom's journey, Wes and Bob take to the air. Wow, this is a great view. From up here, you can really see how runoff from farms and yards can easily reach the river. Pam works with farmers, manufacturers, and state agencies to develop best management practices, or BMPs, to help manage that runoff. Private farmers working voluntarily with local and state agencies have a renewed commitment to cleanse the water discharging from their farms. So we've gone from Deep Creek right up into canal number one, and you can see the obvious problems here. I mean, and this is what we're trying to treat with our uh, wetland treatment and our, our pond. The idea is to capture runoff and direct it into a series of settling ponds. So Tom, this is our 19-acre wet retention pond. It has about 37 days of residence time. After water leaves the retention pond, it enters the wetland marsh, where other contaminants are absorbed by plants and trees. So this is it. Yep, this is it. 38 acres of wetland for treating agricultural runoff. That sandy area down there will turn into a full-fledged marsh, and the plants will do their job cleaning the water the rest of the way. And the runoff returns to the river cleansed. You know, farmers are in business because they love farming. They care about the land. They care about what they're doing. And I'm of the personal belief that there's a lot of culture in the word agriculture. And I think we need to keep that here in Florida. Other best management practices have been designed to give farmers economical ways to conserve resources while protecting their investment. New slow-release fertilizers are one of the most promising recent developments. So what's great about this controlled release technology is it's engineered, these prills are engineered to release as the plant needs it over the season. And so if it's releasing as the plant needs it, that means there's less uh, in the environment that has the potential to leach into the watershed. BMPs have also been adopted for irrigation. Seepage irrigation techniques have been modified and water control structures like dams slow drainage to give plants the chance to soak up what they need. 
When these important techniques are widely implemented, the farmers will conserve water and protect the river from harmful fertilizers. But what few people realize is that much of the contamination does not come from farms. Instead, it is coming from our manicured lawns and businesses. This is really an excellent project. Um, we need more of this kind of stuff in our agricultural areas to keep those nutrients on the agricultural fields and, and out of places like the St. John's River. As they travel south, they enter a region rich in cultural history. The St. John's was Florida's first highway, providing a means to travel into what was otherwise an inhospitable landscape. The team's goal to travel to the source of the river leads them further upstream. They leave behind the broad, deep channel and enter a more intimate river, steered by new forces deep inside the earth. Perhaps no other place on the planet is blessed with such a natural abundance of groundwater discharging from dozens of springs in this stretch of the river. From Silver Springs, which discharges over 350 million gallons of water a day, to secret boils nestled in the North Florida woods, these springs represent over 20% of the river's daily flow. Ponce de Leon searched Florida in pursuit of the Fountain of Youth, and that quest still attracts explorers today. So we're finally here in the land of the springs, Tom. Yeah, yeah, my favorite part of the river, these middle reaches. Springs are usually among the purest sources of fresh water in the world, but this spring is different. Instead of pure fresh water, Silver Glen Springs pumps out brackish water, it is an underwater oasis, salty enough to support ocean life in the middle of a freshwater river. And that influences the animals we find out here. So if snorkeling up these runs, you can see stingrays and needlefish and blue crabs, all these things you don't normally see unless you're out there real close to the ocean or in the ocean. The cave diving team will attempt what few others have accomplished a scientific dive to carry a special probe that will profile the unique water chemistry found here. Their data will reveal an important picture of the aquifer and shed light on the source of elevated salt levels in the spring. The dive they are about to attempt is considered by experts to be among the most difficult dives in the sport. Well, Tom, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I know you have. <laughs> you wrote all the stories. Absolutely. It gets very small in there. You're going to be impressed. And of course, when it gets small, that means the current really goes through the roof. <laughs> I think you're going to, you're going to be, you've got two paddles, and I've only got one. Yeah. <laughs> Underwater, they encounter proof of the elevated levels of salt emerging from deep within the aquifer. Normally found only in salt water, blue crabs and stingrays are found here year round. Okay, Tom, I got you in pond. Let's go. For 40 years, scientists have studied the water at the mouth of the spring. But the divers know there are multiple sources of water, fresh and brackish, that are being mixed together when they come to the surface. Their goal is to be the first people to locate and measure the chemistry at these unique vents. From the start, the going is tough. The divers face a current the equivalent of hurricane force winds. Only it isn't wind, but millions of gallons of water trying to push them back. Well, you know, we're going to have to work hard getting in here today. Nothing. Yeah, this, this is the first magazine spring. This one pumps out enough water to supply a city of, oh, half a million people every day. 
The flow is so intense, the divers approach their penetration more like rock climbers, relying on handholds to make forward progress. I have to wedge myself every inch of the way to get anywhere. Yeah, just don't, just don't hurry. Take your time. They are among the most experienced cave divers on Earth, yet they will need every bit of strength and expertise to face the challenges that await them here. Tom, I think you're caught there. Uh, stuck in the line? Yeah. I think I got it. Wes going to have a hard time pushing that camera through this part of the cave. While exploring this cave, Tom had laid a safety line to find his way out of the darkness. Vitally important to the safety of these divers, that line has been ripped away by the current. They are now forced to find their route through the crisscrossing tunnels while laying new guidelines. Progress is slow, but they press on through the blackness. These, these masks are leaking pretty bad in strong flow. Is he all right? Whew. Sorry about that, Silk. After over one hour of agonizingly slow progress, it's like the eye of the hurricane. The current eases, the floor drops away, and they enter a room of dramatic proportions. Wow, what an amazing room. You could fit a 10-story building in here. Look at that layering. I bet we're looking at over 20 million years of deposition here. Florida's geologic history is a story of the evolution of the ocean. The fossilized deposits that were laid down over time are revealed here for the divers to see. Incredible. I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, this is, to me, it's the most beautiful room in Florida. Jill carries a probe capable of collecting a variety of real-time data on salinity, temperature, depth, conductivity, and pH. Wow, there's a bunch of them. The divers think that they will find the oldest and saltiest water from the deepest vents. All right, I got us at 137 feet. The gathered data reveals that the waters mixed here have very different histories. The fresh water pumping out of the spring is around 30 years old. Yeah, this is that bigger one that's got the saltier water coming out of it. Get that, get that baby well up into the vent. Okay, I'm with you. But isotope dating of the relic seawater revealed that it was between 13,000 and 18,000 years old. Okay, I got the sample, Tom. When sea levels fell during the last ice age, the Floridan aquifer was flooded with seawater, and some of that water remains trapped within pockets in the rock. Okay, good, we got, we're after, let's get out of here. It's a long way back to that entrance. Yeah, it'll be a quick trip though. <laughs> Time is pressing on. They must adhere to strict air rules that reserve two thirds of their gas for the exit from the cave. Jill, make sure you get centered on this little tunnel because that current's gonna shoot you like a bullet down a gun barrel. They continue upstream, traversing Lake George en route. The lake is so large that Bartram described it as a little sea capable of dangerous waves. But today, it's a sea of glass. Their next destination, a first magnitude spring at the center of the dialogue, 
that will help define the delicate balance between the needs of society and the needs of local watersheds and the wildlife within them. Along the eastern shore, they arrive at Blue Spring. You know, we think of this river as pretty much a two-dimensional plain, tributaries feeding into the St. John's like the Oklawaha and the Wakaiva. But really, there's a three-dimensional quality to this river in that there's deep groundwater sources coming from miles and miles away that come almost straight up as a source to the river. And where that water comes to the surface, life is abundant. The West Indian manatee makes these springs its winter home. Manatees can weigh in excess of 3,000 pounds, and their closest relative is the elephant. Mothers nurse their young for a long period, and the calf may remain dependent on its mother for up to two years. Researchers believe this mother-child bond continues for much of the manatee's life. Well, it's within this spring that one of our biggest debates in Florida is growing. It pits the use of water by society against the need of water by our natural ecosystems. The question is, how much water can we take out of the groundwater up in the spring shed before too much water is taken out of the spring, which impacts the life of the manatees? Manatees have no natural predators, but are still an endangered species. Because of the effect man has had on their habitat, there are fewer than 3,000 West Indian manatees left in the United States. Just like humans, manatees need the benefits provided by groundwater flowing to the springs. Springs get their water from relatively local sources known as spring sheds, fed by local rains. Groundwater that is pumped out of the ground for development is water that will no longer reach the springs and river. In order to sustain both the habitat and a reasonable amount of development, a strategy called minimum flows and levels is recommending limits on the withdrawal of groundwater. Blue Spring is one of the first major springs in Florida to have minimum flows and levels recommended for it. If the limits are maintained, development and the manatee should be able to coexist in harmony. We've been looking at and trying to protect primarily those areas that are directly associated with the river. And that may be a little bit like looking at what's coming out of the end of the pipe. Maybe it's time we start looking at what's going into the pipe. I think we need to go upland into the tributaries, which are really the lifeblood of the entire river. They're traveling upstream on the Wakaiva River. Despite the fact that the Wakaiva is the best protected tributary along the entire St. John system, it's what's upstream in the watershed that really matters. This is pretty spectacular. It's hard to believe we're practically in the backyards of Orlando here. Yeah, is that little tributary you were talking about up this way? Yeah, let's check it out, see how far we can get into the development. People who live along this tributary no doubt love the natural beauty in their backyard, but unknowingly, their actions can threaten it. Well, plus all those lawns that people are fertilizing and throwing pesticides on right up there. I mean, that's washing directly in here, and this is a direct conduit to the St. Johns River. Like the farmers downstream, the people who live here need to stop the unregulated runoff of pollutants. Fertilizers make their lawns grow but can be bad for the river. Tom and Jill have explored tributaries around the world. Watch your step here, Jill. There's a lot of rocks. But never one like this. Wow, this is really different. This is different. 
Now just about every urban creek is plumbed through culverts and channels like this. Yeah, we've turned most of these urban creeks and streams into ditches. Here we go, Tom. This is the most unusual tributary so far. Yeah. Careful there, Jill, it's real slippery. No kidding. <laughs> Uh-oh. All right. <laughs> They're traveling through a complex grid of stormwater drains that help safeguard communities from flooding. These concrete conduits have replaced the natural filtration network that used to convey water to the aquifer and local creeks. They carry breathing gear in case of toxic fumes and will have radio contact with the surface. It's team member Simon Mance's job to follow their exploits from topside. Jill, is this you down here? Imagine the volume of water it would take to fill this from all the paved surfaces, the roads, the rooftops, parking lots. Yep. When they pave everything, that water no longer soaks into the ground. It just runs off. Yeah, people don't realize that everything that comes off of the roads and highways ends up down here in these pipes and eventually in the creeks and rivers and tributaries. Formations. It looks just like a real cave. That's really fun. Yeah, it sure is. It's picking up calcium somewhere, either out of the pipe itself or up above, and it's forming little little uh, stalactites. So there's life in the old drainage pipe. Jill, did you bring a watch with you? Yeah. How long have we been down here? Oh, a couple hours. We we've oh, gone man. a good mile at least. Hello, Jill, do you copy? Can you climb up with the radio? Well, let me just uh, call him first. Hey, Simon. Simon, this is Jill. Um, you seem to be really close to a roadway because I hear a lot of cars. Can you see us? I'm underneath the big plate, the rectangular one. OK, this could be it right here. Let's see. Hold on, do you see me? Oh, oh yeah. All right. Oh, there yeah, I see you. Hello, Simon. Hey. How's the weather down there? Cool. <laughs> a little yeah. wet, a little cool. But we're getting a lot of runoff down here, that's for sure. We're going to continue up gradient from here, though. I think uh, it seems to be sort of petering out a little bit and drying up. So we're going to continue onwards from this point. All right, well, I guess I'll see you at the next hole then. OK, yeah. Simon. All right. Um, well, we're kicking up a lot of sludge on the bottom here. Yeah, I'd love to know what's in this water. Well, I think we know. It's the runoff from humanity. Yeah, we got the equivalent of an urban river here. We paved over and created our own concrete version of a river system. Here's another one. Another intersection. Oh, man, it feels good to stand up. It's got a pretty good set of steps. I'm gonna... You need to check it? Yeah, let me see where we are. Hello, Jill, Tom, do you copy? Oh, no, they're not down there. Jill, Tom, hello? Jill, Tom! Hey, Simon! Simon! Whoa! Oh, you okay, ran over. <laughs> Whoa! Color, greenery, blue sky. Hey, hey, trip. Up. Come on up. up. Come on, trip. Trip. Man, what a trip. It feels like we went 100 miles. I wonder how far we really went. So here you are. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do with the canoe and the kayak? <laughs> Obviously, it's not down in that hole, is it, or is it? No, they're ways back. People that live here are used to storm drains, but it's hard for them to imagine that they are part of a mighty river. Why are you 
down in the <laughs> <sewer. laughs> I mean, rivers are usually... Well, we, we really wanted to trace the source of the St. John's River, and so we've been traveling the length of the river and trying to follow every little tributary to see how it connects and to can mankind. can you go by boat, or, or do you have to crawl? Uh, our, our boat's about a couple <laughs> miles that way. And the headwaters are where? Well, you know, in a way, this is a headwater. Um, rain that falls on this parking lot and on these streets comes rushing on down into these stormwater drains, and it's carried on down to a creek where we left our canoes a couple miles away, and then on down to the Wakaiba River and all the way to the St. John's. So it's, it's, um, it's hydrologically connected. Is yeah. there some kind of a filtration system or anything that's... You know, all that water that used to soak into the soil here doesn't do that anymore. It just runs off rapidly and shoo, down the pipes and out into the streams. It's kind of funky in here, isn't it? They're still not at the start of the tributary, so Tom and Jill go back underground. More pipes come in, more trash. I wonder if that means we're getting close to, a, to the surface. There's a little daylight up ahead here. Here it is, Jill, right at the end of the tunnel. Oh, <laughs> After many miles, they have finally reached one source of the St. John's, and it isn't pretty. Trap behind shopping carts. Oh, man, it's gonna feel good to stand up. If I can stand up. Ah. Hmm. Wow. All right, we're out. Well, what do you think? You know, this is a prime example of how people just don't get it. I mean, this is an example of one of the many hundreds of tributaries we've seen. They could just as easily throw this directly in the river. It's getting there, you know? <laughs> you know, there must be some sort of a disconnect that yeah. But most people, I don't think, would throw this stuff right in the main river itself, but, but a lot of them will come over here and, and dump this stuff in these little tributaries. But it is not shopping carts and trash causing. Individual homeowners fertilize their lawns, as do their neighbors and their neighbors' neighbors. Added together, tons of fertilizer soak into the ground and head to the lowest point, the river. This unrealized cumulative impact is perhaps the biggest challenge facing rivers today. Our future also depends on developers and homeowner associations working together to adopt more eco-friendly bylaws instead of their old perceptions of a perfect yard. To look at the land when it's flooded and understand that maybe we shouldn't be trying to live on the edge of these natural systems. Wow. Get out here and explore this again tomorrow. We've discovered a little paradise back here. Incredible. Hurricane rains and high waters provide the team with a unique chance to explore the upper river under flood conditions. We returned to the Sable Palm area I found last night and it's even more beautiful at this light early in the morning. We're just cruising through the forest, following the flow of the St. John's as it is flooding through this marsh floodplain. You know, here getting down at this level, you really experience the river. You think you're experiencing it on our craft as we cruise the river, but it has a more intimate feel down at this level. 
Good cruising up ahead. Having traveled over 170 miles, they reached the end of easily navigable waters. We're at about mile marker 170. The river is 310, so we're a little over halfway of the journey at this point. So I think, you know, what the strategy may be sound, you know, based on the difficulty in, in navigation is to get us as far as, as we can get and then I will downsize. We're gonna mm -hmm. reduce the number of the team and get into boats and make our way south from there in right. smaller craft. Right. It's time to say goodbye to the comforts of their large vessels. They will travel the final stretch by other means. With an aircraft engine and large propeller supplying the thrust, airboats literally fly across the wetlands. As eyes for their navigation, Wes and Bob take to the sky. This is the only way to go, Captain Bob, the flying boats. <laughs> to be successful, they will have to negotiate over 130 miles of shallow braided marsh. At speeds up to 50 miles per hour, they race south through a maze of lakes connected by a series of broad flood plains. Hey guys, you're coming up on one of the biggest restoration projects in the world. In the early 1900s, this part of Florida held significant economic potential for farming. The only problem was the land was easily flooded by the constant fluctuations of the river. It was a time when great engineering feats brought untold wealth and opportunity. E. Nelson Fell, a New Zealander and engineer, saw the vast floodplain as wasted land that could be tamed. Attracting a small group of investors, he launched one of the largest individual drainage projects ever conceived. He built a fleet of enormous dredges and plows to drain the St. John's Marsh and convert it into farmland. When completed, he had transformed over 125 square miles and unknowingly cut off the headwaters of the river, forever altering the watershed. It was a time of industrial innocence when government, businesses, and citizens had little concept of environmental consequences. Hurricanes spawned public outcry for the federal government to take further flood control measures. The river lost much of its vitality and life, and polluted runoff began to heavily impact the river and marsh. In many ways, it's very similar to the challenges facing the Everglades. By the 1970s, scientists and environmentalists began to understand that the natural floodplain had to be restored. Well, this is the, what we call a Farm 13 stick marsh, right in the middle of uh, 150, 160,000 acres of restoration, which really is the second largest restoration in the entire world right now. Only the Everglades uh, rivals this in form and size. Water from nearby citrus groves and livestock pastures is now discharged into large reservoirs which keep nutrient-rich runoff from directly entering the marsh. Local aquatic plants help metabolize nutrients and other waste found in the runoff. This protective strategy also saves money for local farmers who can reuse water from the reservoirs. 
A testament to the success of the restoration is found through sport fishermen who rate Farm 13 Stick Marsh as some of the best largemouth bass fishing in the world. And that effort is breathing new life into the headwaters of the St. John's River. Water is once again cleansed as its sheet flows across the vast flood plain marshes. Lost habitat has been renewed and fish and wildlife are returning. Every aspect gives us new appreciation for what an incredible place this is. falls here in the vast flood plain slowly moves down into the river watersheds, where it is joined by a magnificent maze of lakes and magical water welling up from the springs downstream. This is it. This is the uh, last definable little creek we've got before we, uh, you know, before it just goes into open marsh. And uh, we're all 300 miles now from the uh, mouth of the river and just broad expanse of marsh, beautiful stuff. This whole trip has, has just really turned me around again, really revitalized my whole spirit. I really love this river. I just almost regret any form of damage or hurt that someone wants to put on this river because it's so beautiful. Without it, we couldn't survive. I mean, we just couldn't survive. This is one of the great environmental success stories of all time. Over 250 square miles of what was farmland returned back to the river. It really makes you feel good and gives us hope for the restoration of the Everglades. In this experience on the St. John's, I got a true sense of the three-dimensional qualities of this river and how it's fed by branches from underground and by branches and tendrils that reach way back into urban societies. And I started this journey thinking that we were going on a quest, a, a quest to find the true source of this river. Uh, and, and what I discovered is that that source is everywhere. It's in every home, it's in every development, it's through every person. And all of our actions have an influence on the water quality that we experience from this river. The goal just simply has to be to, to lessen the impact we're having as humans on these environments. And we can do that. We really can. We can learn to use less fertilizers in our yards. We can use less water. Uh, we can be more conscientious of how we divert waters into these systems. And if we do these simple things, we can actually uh, improve the water quality and improve the health of the entire river. It makes sense. Everything we do, all of our runoff, no matter how far away, impacts our watersheds. That's the connection we must make.
people will only protect what they love. And through understanding lies hope to return watersheds worldwide to more pristine days. Dive into more information about The River Returns. You can find us at www.watersjourney.com. To order a copy of Water's Journey, The River Returns on DVD or VHS, call 1-386-454-2376. Major funding provided by the St. Johns River Water Management District with assistance from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Florida Department of Education, and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection.